because of the importance of this document, I have decided to upload an English translation alongside the previously available Tagalog version. This document had never been used before in the writing of Philippine history, in part or in its entirety, due to various reasons that historians have yet to explain. In the interest of posterity, I am therefore uploading this full account, translated in English, so that present and future generation of Filipinos will be able to chart the destiny of this country in the coming years, armed with the knowledge imparted in this account. Magandang araw po, kahit nasaan man kayo ngayon. When we were in Balara, they didn't stop patching for us and sending us invitations. Because of their persistent suasion of undress, we went there. When we arrived, we were welcomed in Bakood and then proceeded to Imus. We didn't stop there and went to San Francisco de Malabon. We were warmly welcomed and Andres was introduced to the entire domain of Cavite as the leader they recognized. But it didn't take long for the president of the Magdalo to attack Andres. When Andres learned of this, he immediately notified them that he will leave. The two kingdoms then dissuaded Andres and the Magdalo apologized. Andres was mollified. Not long after, they requested to conduct an assembly. Andres did not agree to this request and suggested that they first call on the headquarters at Balara or distribute a circular to every chapter. They refused and said never mind. They also manifested that whatever happens, their request would come to pass. And they thereafter formed a committee and agreed that Andres will still be President and Supremo. After a day, however, they no longer agreed among themselves. Thereafter, our portions of the bullets which passed by their areas were opened, as well as the powder and guns. Likewise, the bullets that came from our areas were confiscated. Amid all this, Andres kept his silence about these wrongful deeds. When Hoxon arrived in Magdalo territory, everyone agreed that he should be sent to Hong Kong. They drafted an agreement that they asked us to sign. But when this agreement reached the Magdalos, they changed the authority and put their presidency as the sole authority. Andres still kept his silence and bore their actions for the sake of his friend who was tasked to smuggle arms. The Magdalos asked for money, which was immediately given. But after receiving the sum, no update ever reached the Magdiwa. When Pasiano Rizal learned about the forthcoming arms, he immediately went to Look. Andres followed him there. And for several days or a week, they bore the hardships of the days and nights in those mountains. Suddenly, three women arrived in Imus, bearing a letter from Pola Vieja, asking for a sit-down with the leader of the Tagalogs. The emissaries relayed that whatever the Tagalogs want, the Spaniards would agree. Thereafter, the Magdalos went to the Magdiwang officers to confer in secret first before informing the Magdiwang leadership. And they talked in secret thereafter and provided a copy of the said letter only later on. They then Im demanded an immediate reply. But they were told that the Supremo was away and that they had no disposition to answer that request yet. The Magdalos refused to delay the response any further and asked that the Supremo be fetched in Loc. 
Andres thus came home. Expectedly, Andres refused to talk or compromise with our enemy. After that, the news spread that the Magdalos were willing to talk. Two days later, they called for a meeting. Andres thought that the meeting was all about that request for negotiation by our enemy. But when he and his companions arrived at the Hacienda House in Tijeros, the meeting was all about the establishment of a government. In this matter, Andres relented. But before opening the meeting, Andres made everybody understand that apart from the few that he had with him at that moment, he had no representatives from his domain. Furthermore, Andres manifested that whoever wins in the coming elections, he himself would be the first to recognize the winners and introduce them to his domain. But Andres made it also clear that it should be the will of the majority and born out of the proper procedure. Otherwise, if the elections will be conducted in a dirty manner and the true will of the majority and the people are not followed, Andres would be the first one to repudiate it. With these manifestations, the meeting was opened. Everyone agreed that elections be held, but the proper procedures were not observed. Everyone who went up to the Hacienda House was included, even though they did not know the previous discussions. And when these people inquired what they will write on the pieces of paper given to them, they were told to write Emilio Aguinaldo. The people who didn't know how to write were given pieces of paper that already had the name written on them. And a representative of my pag-asa named Apolonio Samson was mistaken for someone else and was whispered to write Emilio Aguinaldo. Others can attest to these events and have proofs to show. But Andres kept silent and let them be. When Andres emerged as the director of the interior, he was toasted by the majority with shouts of Biba. Around the second or third shouts of Biba, the Magdalo Minister of War, Daniel Tirona, stood up and told the crowd to wait for a while because that position required a lawyer or a man of talent. The majority of the leaders were offended and declared the meeting as nolo or null and void. It was truly raucous, but Andres maintained his silence. When order came back, he and his companions left. Others refused to continue the meeting. The day after, they who shared the same sentiments secretly met at the Tansa convent. They insisted that Artemio Ricarte become the general-in-chief of the islands. But he refused and even wrote a protest note which you can read. When we were preparing to leave the next day, a commotion ensued in Malabon, Naik, and other towns. They said that if the Supremo will leave, they would all come with him. Others looked for and waited for the leaders who secretly conspired with the Magdalos. When Andres learned of these actions, he calmed everyone down. When calm had returned, the said leaders came to him, accompanied by the king of the Magdiwang, and they asked for forgiveness. And they said that if the act will cause discord and disunity among the people, 
they will tear it up to pieces. That calmed the people down. But they swore vengeance on us because of that. When the Spaniards overran Imus, the Magdalos retreated to Tansa. When Malabon fell, they went to Naik. That was where we mingled with them. When their leaders and soldiers learned where we, we were there, they went to the house where we were staying and said that they had no food to eat and no clothes to change with because they left everything in Imus and that they also have nothing to feed their families. When Andres learned of their plight, he had no recourse but to ask the president of the Magdiwang, Mr. Mariano Alvarez, to help them. They were immediately provided with relief, including the widows whom they refused to give alms. And it so happened that Mr. Pio del Pilar and other Magdalo leaders conferred with Andres and suggested that the troops be joined as one so as to be an effective force. And in fact, that was the agreement they all signed later on. When it was concluded, there soon came the request for help in Indang. But Andres could not provide soldiers because everyone was in their battle stations. They suggested that the few remaining rifles should be sent there. Andres agreed to this on the condition that the loaned rifles would be replaced or would even be returned with additional ones. They promised to do so, but they did not do as promised. We did not bug them on that bridge of promise. It was night time when we arrived the next day, and Andres went to the tribunal and said to them that the town should be reinforced because he feared that the town's defense was shaky. The president replied that the town need not be reinforced. He said that just provide them the arms and the Spaniards will not be able to enter the town. Andres replied that in any case, the church perimeter defense should be reinforced because that's where the Spanish troops usually go to. That became their agreement. Their bad treatment of us started thereafter. Our troops were refused to be fed. And if ever they were fed, it was with unpolished rice. One day, when our troops arrived for dinner, after conducting a reconnaissance patrol to look for metal that would be used for pressing and making capsules, they were told to wait for their meals until the next day. The troops waited the stove, but when they were really hungry, Around 11 a.m. the next day, they approached the cooks to ask if their meals were ready. The cooks told them that they were instructed by the president to ask for their credentials first. The troops then decided to look for the Supremo and upon approaching the house where he was, the Supremo and his companions went down and pacified the soldiers. They then went to see the President of Indang who asked for forgiveness for everything that happened. They soon settled the matter. But then, the President said this to me. Just like what Capitan Emilio said to me, ever since your group arrived here in Cavite, he and his uncles and relatives no longer cooperated with one another. I replied, Is that so? I never knew that this revolution was only among relatives. But I know that we came here for the defense of the motherland. But if that is not the case, then we will leave immediately. So that was why they treated us badly. That's the reason why we suddenly left that night. Because if those words were uttered by somebody other than that president, 
it would not have mattered. But they were from someone Andres had always conversed with. And it was when we were gone that they held a secret meeting and revived the act which they earlier promised to tear up to pieces. And so it came to pass that Emilio Aguinaldo was still the president and the one I earlier talked with became the Minister of Grace and Justice. After these designations, they then plotted against us. They plotted to chase us and provoke us to anger. And the instruction from them was, if we will react in anger, they will kill us all, or confiscate our arms and hug tie and dress along with the soldiers. And thus, they sent their troops, who even at a distance notified us that our arms will be confiscated. We could not immediately react. A few moments later, the troops surrounded us and their colonel went upstairs. He was greeted politely and asked where his destination was. His reply was that they will conduct a reconnaissance of Silang and that they pass by our camp because they haven't had breakfast yet. He asked us how we were and wondered if we have difficulty procuring food. The answer was not really, because right now it was better here than in Indang, because there were arms coming in which did not consist of unpolished rice. The colonel answered back that the situation in Indang was better because rice from Naik was coming in. He then suggested that if the Suprema wanted it, they could all go back to Indang to partake together in the houses there. Andres replied that he will not go back to the town of Indang where he was thoroughly aggrieved by the brothers there and would rather not see such injustice with his eyes again. With that declaration, the conversation stopped and they just continued eating breakfast together. After the meal, the colonel bid farewell and said that they were late already, and further said they will return to eat lunch there along with his troops. But in leaving the battery line, he closed it and ordered the guards to forbid anyone from leaving, including the family and troops of the Supremo. The punishment, if they allowed them, was that their lives would be forfeit. That was his command, and he left some of his troops to be stationed there for insurance. When some of our soldiers attempted to cross the line to deliver meals to those outside, the guard suddenly wouldn't let them. Andres only knew about it when those who were refused exit converge and talk among themselves. Those soldiers who were stationed outside the battery were all disarmed and taken away. With that act, some of our men tried to follow them to ask what they were doing, but they could not catch up with them. Our men just waited for them to pass by again to inquire what the real order was. But night soon came. They then came for all the women, and the utensils and implements of everyone. One managed to run towards us and report to the soldiers that their wives had been taken. Our soldiers wanted to follow them and accost them for such action, but were prevented from crossing the battery line. They decided to wait there. When Andres learned of this development, he sent word 
that he wanted to talk to their leader because he said it was obscene if they will fight among themselves. The messenger came back with the reply that the other party did not want to talk and that bullets will take care of the Supremo. At around dawn, they began shooting from the opposite trees. I woke Andres, who immediately went down and was met by a soldier who reported that the troops were coming in and were already close by. When they arrived, an exchange of gunfire erupted and they conducted a guerrilla assault against us. Andres ordered our troops to stand down and not return fire. And everyone from our ranks was shouting, Brothers, don't shoot! Let's all sit down together and discuss what you want. But the attackers paid no heed to this pleas. And when they approached Andres, they simultaneously shot him. And when he fell, he was stabbed with a knife and bludgeoned further. My brother-in-law, Siriaco, was held by two men and shot, killing him. Procopio was tied up and stabbed with a revolver. After all this commotion, the wounded were placed in a hammock, and those tied up were brought to town. When they saw me from where I was hiding, I was fetched by their troops and forced to reveal where the supposed money of Cabite or Safe was. They confiscated my revolver and the meager sum of money I had. Afterward, they tried to tie me to a tree and tried to force me to reveal where the money I supposedly hold from Cabite was located. Other brothers can attest that we survived here on food brought by our supporters. When they could not force anything from me, I was brought to that tribunal in Indang. It was there that I passed by the wounded man whom they stripped naked and covered with only a blanket. When I approached them and wasn't penis tending to them, they wanted to tie me up and be brought to Naik. Only through the intercession of some was I left alone. The next day, we were brought by the troops from Indang to Maragundon to Naik. Oh, my dear brothers, when we arrived in that town, we were brought to the former quarters of the enemy. We waited for two hours by the door and one hour by the staircase. We were then brought up and directed to the kitchen. Andres was placed in the bathroom of the former Paris priest, which was like a dungeon. I was prevented from approaching him, and when I persisted, I was imprisoned in a room and held incommunicado. On this matter, when two generals told me that they will get our declarations, I appealed to them to please ensure that justice is served to us, that before any declaration from Andres is taken, the other leader should be brought before the tribunal so that he could question them in front of everybody. They agreed with me and told me that such was only proper. But that did not happen, and after more than a week, we were sent back again to Maragondon. On the third day there, they took the declaration of Pedro Hiron, whom they paid and tutored on the false testimony that the Supremo tended to have all the Magdalos killed, including those that agreed with them. They had locked up Hiron previously, but sent him free after his testimony. When Andres requested to cross-examine him, their reply was that he was killed in night. 
But why is he in their company now? After the summaries, it was said that Capitan Emilio ordered the prisoner shot after 24 hours. They did not want to see Andres defend himself and the counsel he requested was prevented from appearing. After a respite of four or five days, the punishment of banishment or disquero came out. I asked the other leaders if that was true. They replied that if one believes the words of others, and they said that in fact, the prosecuting fiscal will still come to us and assured us to calm ourselves down and that nothing untoward will happen. Two days later at around 8 o'clock in the evening, under heavy rains, an order came to the captain called Castilla to bring the prisoners downstairs. I pleaded to Commandant Lazaro Macapagal, who would eventually transport and kill Andres, to please wait for the rains to subside or for tomorrow to transport the wounded men. Macapagal refused my pleading because it was supposedly the order of the leader. He advised me to plead with him directly in any case. So I went to look for Emilio. I was accompanied by two women and we nearly crawled under the heavy rains and darkness. After crossing the river and reaching the place where he was, we could not proceed immediately because we were dripping wet. When we have already climbed the house, Emilio hid in a room and we were told that he was sick and already sleeping. But I heard him awake and talking to Hoxon. When Hoxon came out, he went to Pedro Lipana, who was supposedly Emilio's secretary. He then went to me and asked me what I wanted. I pleaded to him to please postpone for tomorrow the transport of the men. He told me it was not possible. I then notified him that I will go home. When we were already going down the staircase, we were told to wait for the letter we will give to the guard. When the letter was finished, it was handed to two soldiers who were ordered to accompany us. It turned out to be a letter meant for the tribunal. And when we arrived at the home of the president, I was locked up. When I continued my pleadings, I was told that I would be shot. Nobody then was able to approach me. They transported the brothers the next day around lunch. When that afternoon, a battle erupted in the outskirts of the town not far from where I was held. I was released. Upon regaining my freedom, I began looking for Andres and crossed the other reeds where I chanced upon the troops who transported him. They had with them the clothes I solicited for the brothers, including the blanket and the medicine I used to tend to their wounds. When I asked them where the brothers were, they told me they were in the mountains in the house of a lieutenant. I asked them why they were carrying the clothes. They replied that they were told to let me take care of them. Oh, my dear brothers, I started walking to that place they pointed to me as to where the brothers were. But when I reached that place, I was told to go instead to the other mountain, which was so steep when I climbed it. But when we got there, there was nobody there. We walked again and again. Oh, my dear brothers, we searched those mountains for two weeks without letting up, except during the night. When we couldn't find them, we followed and asked the troops. We were given all sorts of directions until now. I only finally stopped and got out of there when my uncle told me the truth. 
and provided me with a decent meal before they left their positions. My brothers, think about if what they did to us was justified or not. Others can corroborate this story and you will hear from them soon. My brothers, I am thankful that I survived despite the hardships I experienced. I roamed around for almost a month and we had nothing to eat but unripe bananas. If ever we are given small amounts of rice, my companions cooked porridge and made me eat it. My clothes can no longer catch fire. This is all and nothing more. My profuse greetings to everyone in your location. I have nothing to ask but pity for my plight and the chance to talk so that you may understand everything. I await your responses, my beloved. Remember that the cause of all these troubles is the first traitor to the Katapunan and had been expelled even before the troubles started. That is why he acted like this.